the Institute of Xenobiology and Biotechics on Luna, arguably one of the most prestigious institutions in the known galaxy, if not the most prestigious, in its field at least, located on a moon orbiting the human homeworld of Earth. It had been called home by many of the greatest thinkers and innovators in the galaxy. It was and still remains a place where all species gather to learn and advance their knowledge of each other together. Humans, though unusual at first, are truly fascinating beings. Having evolved on a high-gravity world, their physiology has been studied thoroughly by many. According to the standard measurement system, Earth's gravity is 2.21 sg. Standard gravity. While the gravity on my planet is only 1.98 sg. Since the institution orbits around Luna as opposed to being on the surface of the Moon, gravity can be altered by chaining the rotation speed of the station. The SG is held at exactly 2.00. Naturally, I feel completely comfortable at this gravity. Most other species' comfortable range goes from 1.7 to 2. 2 SG, the humans, of course, being at the very top. Now, why would I write something so widely known? Something every child, pup, or hatchling learns in their early education. Well, because I was apparently wrong about the human SG tolerance. A few days ago, I was in class. And that day we had a class focused on human physiology and morphology. Our professor, also being an earthborn human, entered the classroom. I am saying earthborn with a reason. You will find out later why this is. Anyway, the lecture began simply. Good day to all of you, the human professor said with a smile of his face. My name is Richard Larson, and I will be your human studies professor for the rest of this cycle. Though before we begin, I must inform you that next week I have some personal things I must attend to, so a substitute will come to replace me for about a week. I remember he was amicable and approachable. I was excited to begin a new cycle, finally learning more of the humans that made this wonderful institution a reality. I knew some things about humans from my own personal research. I knew they were incredibly diverse when it came to height, color, and culture. Despite having stark differences, sometimes they were still the same species. And of course, humans were distinct from other species. No matter which type of human you saw, you would know they were human at a glance. What made it even more fascinating, all these distinctions were all on one planet. The genetic differences were nigh non-existent, yet the differences were clearly visible. I couldn't wait to learn more about them, and learn I did. So I am sure you are all familiar with the fact that humans come in all different shapes and sizes, Professor Richard said. There were some nods of approval from the class of a few hundred students. That's great. Well, today for the first lesson we will expand on the different varieties of human and how those differences came to be. For the record, we will be focusing on the standard Earth-born human since they do make up the vast majority of the human population. For now. A good example is yours truly, Professor Richard pointed at himself. But despite the glaring diversity Earthborn humans come in, those differences are mostly visual in nature. The professor turned around and looked at the large white board behind him. The board shifted and revealed a star map on its surface. Here you can see the territorial possessions of the human species, including all the constituent territories and colonial holdings. In the center you can see Saul. This is where we are currently located, as you know, of course. And here we shall start our journey. The picture shifted to a visual representation of the planet Earth and Mars. Below the planets, there was a visual representation of two pairs of humans, male and female. The main difference between Earth-born humans and Mars-born humans is born from the amount of sunlight and the gravity of both planets. On Mars, the gravity is 62% weaker than on Earth. In standard measurement, it would be 0.83 sg. My eyes went wide when I heard that, have I ever met a Martian human? No, I knew this planet was inhabited by millions of humans. The professor must have made a mistake. I raised my hand. Yes, the professor said. Sir, I think you must have made a mistake of some kind. It is simply improbable a human would survive long term on a planet with such low gravity. The bones would degrade and the muscles would atrophy. The gravity must be higher. To my knowledge, Mars is one of the most populous planets after Earth. The professor nodded. Well, you are correct in the health aspect of that. And that was an issue in the beginning of the colonization efforts for about a few centuries before the local population simply adapted to the environment. 
So the gravity is 0 0.83 SG? The professor nodded and then continued with the lecture. Anyway, as you can see, the Martian human is taller and lankier than the standard Earth human. They tend to have paler skin and albinism is much more rampant in their population. That is due to the lack of sunlight in the early years of colonization. Today, after thorough terraforming, Mars is a more amicable place to live, though the evolutionary adaptations still persist today. The average height for an adult male Martian human is 2.2 meters, or 5.4 SHM, and they weigh about 60 kilograms on Earth, roughly 23 kilograms on Mars. Their muscle mass is significantly smaller than that of an Earth human, and their bones are comparatively brittle. When a Martian is visiting Earth's surface, he or she is advised to train months in advance. They are also given a specialized exoskeleton to aid them in walking as well as medication to keep their heart from failing. Other than that, Martians are among the top scientists and engineers we have. I was absolutely horrified when I heard that. Who was mad enough to go to an uninhabitable planet whose gravity and environment were utterly unsuitable for intelligent life? No, any life for that matter. Sir, I raised my hand. Why haven't you humans chosen a planet more suitable for colonization? I assume since this was one of the first planets you colonized, you had no access to advanced terraforming technology and the gravity? Why not choose a planet more in line with what is comfortable with humans? The professor stared at me blankly for a few moments before replying. We humans are an ambitious bunch. Hence, when the opportunity presented itself, some humans went there to make a new life for themselves. You can find a lot of literature focusing on the history of the early stages of human space travel and colonization, if you are interested. Anyway, the professor continued with his lecture. For a good 30 minutes, I couldn't even listen as he listed off some of the other types of humans found in various colonies across human space. Thankfully, not all of them were extreme as the Martian humans. My mind was still processing the Martian human and their course of expedited evolution. The whole thing was utterly insane to me. Then he finally came to the last type of human. And finally, we have the Laconian human. The professor said, as the screen on the whiteboard showed a rather large, dry, and rocky planet. Beneath were a pair of humans, male and female, like in all of the ones before they were contrasted to the Earth human. These humans, I saw, were much shorter yet much bulkier than any of the previous ones. The Laconian human is by far the least populous. They came into being in the last 1500 cycles after being exposed to by far the most extreme environment known where a human can live without any special equipment. I gulped at that statement. The planet LX2563, or colloquially known as Laconia, is a rocky exoplanet which is mostly dry save for a small ocean on the northern pole of the planet. It is twice the size of Earth in circumference and has a gravity of 2.1 g's, or roughly 4.4 sg. I coughed, nearly choked on myself. I could see the other students, other than a few humans present, also go pale at the statement. 4.4 standard gravity. No intelligent being is known to survive on such worlds, none. How haven't I heard of this before is beyond me. The professor paused for half a minute to give us a reprieve. It seems like this isn't the first time he got this kind of reaction. So, the average Laconian human male stands at a height of 1.4 meters and weights 120 kilograms on Earth, or around 240 kilograms on Laconia. Their muscle mass is much higher than that of a standard Earth human, their muscle fibers are also much more dense, giving them immense strength even on the gravity in which they live in. Their bones are thicker and much more dense as well. Their cardiovascular system is significantly stronger than the standard Earth human. Their heart is 45% larger than a standard Earth human. The professor paused. There was an uncomfortable silence in the classroom. How in the six damned hells did the first colonists survive? I asked without raising my hand. That's the thing. Not a lot of them did survive, but as the saying goes, species evolve quicker when it's difficult to thrive. The professor cleared his throat before continuing the lecture. As I've said, the Laconian human is vastly more different than the Earth human, as you can see. But for all the strength they jave, they lack sorely in mobility. They aren't fast runners, and they lack stamina. Despite this, they make up a disproportionate amount of miners. 
They are also known to be excellent machinists and shipbuilders. Oh, and I almost forgot. If a Laconian human were to visit Earth, they would have to worry about muscle atrophy and, of course, their bones degrading. For that, a special suit was designed in which they wear 100 to 150 kilograms of heavy lead plates to simulate the gravity of Laconia. They are also advised to train cardio while on Earth to keep their heart in good health. I was damn near on the verge of getting up and leaving the class. I couldn't believe my ears, and I nearly couldn't believe my eyes as well. Those pictures did not lie, I am afraid. Are there any other differences between a Laconian human and an Earth human? Someone asked from the back of the classroom. There are some, but we will cover them in detail later. The main difference between a Laconian and I is, well, a Laconian can bench press 300 kilograms without breaking a sweat and flip a two-ton car with little effort. The professor chuckled. For him, this was funny, but for me, I needed some time to process this. All right, this lecture is ending soon, so I'll leave you with a small fun fact. Martian humans are sometimes compared to elves, a mythical humanoid being from folklore, tall, pale, and elegant. While the Laconians are quite frequently compared to dwarves, another humanoid being from folklore, known for their short stature, immense strength and ingenuity. Myths that came to life, wouldn't you say? The bell rang right after, thankfully. I got up and was ready to leave. But as soon as I reached the door, I heard the professor speak once more. One more thing. Next week's substitute is Professor Meyer Krill, coincidentally a native-born Laconian. Brilliant man. I gulped again. By the gods, have mercy upon me and my colleagues, I said to myself as I exited the lecture hall.